Did you know that, according to Tolkien, Gandalf, Saruman and the rest of the Astari had an earlier mission to Middle-earth that they seem to have all forgotten about? Really, let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we dive deep into Tolkien's lore and legendarium. If you're new here, welcome. When Gandalf, Saruman and the other Astari arrived in Middle-earth around the year a thousand of the Third Age, it was to help the free peoples of Middle-earth in opposing Sauron. And most of us have always assumed that it is the first time these five were there. But when you read the account of what happened in Unfinished Tales, there's a surprising hint that perhaps it's not. We're told that these five Maiar were clad in bodies as of men, real and not feigned, but subject to the fears and pains and weariness of earth, able to hunger and thirst and be slain, though because of their noble spirits they did not die, and aged only by the cares and labour of many long years. And this the Valar did, desiring to amend the errors of old, especially that they had attempted to guard and seclude the Eldar by their own might and glory fully revealed, whereas now their emissaries were forbidden to reveal themselves in forms of majesty, or to seek to rule the wills of men or elves by open display of power, but coming in shapes weak and humble, were bidden to advise and persuade men and elves to good, and to seek to unite in love and understanding all those whom Sauron, should he come again, would endeavour to dominate and corrupt. So, the decision to send the Astari as old men there to advise and help rather than in full power wasn't just a random wise decision. It was an attempt, in Tolkien's words, to amend the errors of old when they had tried to protect the elves with their full power on show. So, what happened back then? And when? And why was it an error? And who exactly were these emissaries? Lots of questions, and it's always been a bit of a mystery in Tolkien circles. We have some hints, and people have speculated, of course, but it is only with the publication of The Nature of Middle-earth last year, a collection of largely previously unreleased notes from the great man, edited by Karl Hostetter, that we got a full answer. In particular, we get to see some timelines that Tolkien wrote out over the course of several months in 1959. That's a few years after the publication of The Lord of the Rings. Although, as we'll see, there's evidence to suggest that this had been on Tolkien's mind for a while. So, what is this earlier mission, and how did it go so wrong? To answer this, we need to go way back in time to when the elves first awakened in Middle-earth. Tolkien gives us a lot of background and history as to how everything ended up like this, but basically, when they awoke, the Valar were no longer living in Middle-earth, and were instead on their new continent of Aman, just visiting Middle-earth occasionally. Someone, however, who was very much in Middle-earth was Morgoth. So when the elves awakened, entirely innocent in the world, they were in immediate danger, and the Valar weren't there to protect them. However, in an annal chronicling the awakening of the first 144 elves at Quivienen, we learned that the Maya Melian, having been warned in a dream, leaves Valinor and goes to Middle-earth. When there, she finds and sets herself up with these newly formed elves and presumably protects them from being wiped out completely by Morgoth. She remains there with them for perhaps a couple of thousand years. Incidentally, for those well-versed in the Silmarillion, yes, this is the same Melian who later entranced and married King Thingol the Elf, protected Doriath with her magic, and from whom so many great heroes descended. Luthien, Elwing, Elrond, Elros. It all ties in, and perhaps even softens some of the harsher elements of the story we already know. For example, she and Thingol almost certainly knew each other, and perhaps even cared for each other for a long time before she entranced him with magic, forcing his people to search so long and hard for him. It wasn't just a random meeting in the woods, as it sometimes can seem in the Silmarillion. Anyway, eventually, Rome the Valar also stumbles across the elves, stays with them for a few years, and heads back to the rest of the Valar to decide what to do with them. This is quite a tricky decision for the Valar. They want to protect the elves from Morgoth, but know that another war with him would devastate the land. They want to bring the elves to the safety of Aman, but respect that Aru put them in Middle-earth. Eventually, they settle on a plan to strongly invite, but not compel, the elves to come over to their land. 
There's a bit of toing and froing with three elven emissaries heading west first to check out this new land, and in the meantime, the elves needed protecting. So we read this. The Valar send five guardians, great spirits of the Maiar, with Melian, the only woman but the chief, these make six. The others were Tarindor, later Saruman, Alorin, Gandalf, Ravandil, Radagast, Palacendo and Hymenar. Are Palacendo and Hymenar the later blue wizards? It seems likely, given that the other guardians are the other three Astari. And linguistically, Palacendo means far-sighted one, an echo perhaps of Palando, one of the Blue Wizards, and Hymenar, Alatar sound similar-ish, we don't know for sure, but we do know that Saruman, Gandalf and Radagast were there. And they were not as the old men we would recognise, but as great spirits of the Maiar, in full power in other words. And as far as we can tell, they did their job. The elves were protected and Morgoth resisted in the main. But to return to the main narrative here, Orome's return with these powerful guardian spirits actually provoked some rather heretical thoughts among the elves. Some began to believe that, although the Valar clearly do exist, they have abandoned Middle-earth. Rightly, as the appointed realm of the Quendi, now they are becoming jealous and wish to control the Quendi as vassals, and so repossess themselves of Middle-earth. Finwe, a gallant and adventurous young Quende, direct descendant of Tata, is much taken by these ideas. Less so is his friend Elwe, descendant of Enel. For those keeping track, the rebellious Finwe here is the father of the much later rebellious Feanor, and Elwe, the conformist, is the elf who later marries Melian the Maya. So the Valar sending clearly very powerful Maiar guardians, Gandalf, Saruman and so on, to protect the elves, actually didn't really reassure the elves of the Valar's good intentions, quite the opposite in fact. A significant number grew suspicious and resentful. What happened next? Well, the Valar pushed their invite hard, and most of the elves set off westwards. Some don't, however, staying where they are, and some of those who did start out on the journey stopped on the way. Some of those who made it all the way decided to actually stay on an island just off the coast of Amman. Some of those who did make it all the way to the mainland and settled in Amman later rebelled and headed back, led by Feanor, the seeds of which, Tolkien tells us, were planted with the earlier murmurings against the Valar and the Maiar. And at some stage, those five trusted, powerful Maiar were stood down from their role and returned to whatever they had been doing before in Amman. And time passed. Millennia later, when the Valar decided once more that they wished to help the free peoples of Middle-earth, sending emissaries to aid in the opposition to Sauron, they seemingly remembered who they had sent before and chose to send them again. But to return to that quote we started with, the Valar decided to send them not in full power like last time, but as old men. Why? Because they were desiring to amend the errors of old, especially that they had attempted to guard and seclude the Eldar by their own might and glory fully revealed. The Valar had learned their lesson from the first time around. Gandalf, Saruman and co. had been in Middle-earth with their might and glory fully revealed. There are hints that perhaps they, maybe Saruman, had used that power imbalance with the elves to try to force them into doing things. The invitation to leave the only home they'd known and head en masse to Aman was a show of power and might. Did it make the elves wonder if they really did have a choice? And the result was rebellion. Some refused the Valar's wishes, some seemingly set off grudgingly and stopped on the way. One fell head over heels in love with one of the Maya when she used her power and stayed in Middle-earth with his people. The seeds of discontent lingered right through to Feanor's rebellion. All in all, not what the Valar had intended. So when they sent those Maiar back to Middle-earth in the Third Age, they tried a different approach. Support, advice and encouragement, clothed in shapes weak and humble. At least, that was the idea. But why did I call this a forgotten mission? Because for the Astari themselves, it was. We're told, 
that being embodied, the Astari had need to learn much anew by slow experience, and though they knew whence they came, the memory of the Blessed Realm was to them a vision from afar off, for which, so long as they remained true to their original mission, they yearned exceedingly. Gandalf twice says that he has forgotten his life before this mission, other than that yearning to return. Although this extra bit of history for Gandalf, Saruman, Radagast, and probably the Blue Wizards was written after The Lord of the Rings was published, and after he had written the essay on the Astari in Unfinished Tales, it doesn't contradict anything there. Indeed, it seems to fill in a few gaps, as if Tolkien had this in the back of his mind all along, but only fleshed it out on paper later. I've already mentioned how this hints that Thingol very probably knew and liked Melian before she entranced him, so perhaps that was just a part of their romance rather than the start of it. It also explains why we're told that Manwe wanted Alorin Gandalf to go on the mission in the Third Age because Alorin was a lover of the Eldar that remained. Remained here could mean a number of things, but the context suggests that Gandalf loved those elves who remained in Middle-earth, which makes so much more sense if he had spent all that time with them. And this adds another layer to that wonderful interaction we have between Curdan and Gandalf, when Gandalf arrived in Middle-earth in the Third Age. Curdan chose to give the Ring of Power Naya to Gandalf, not the mightiest or the leader of the Astari. Why? Well, yes, Curdan was gifted with foresight and wisdom, but also he probably met all those Astari before on their first mission. In fact, Curdan is the only remaining elf we know to have been there. And if he had met Gandalf then, even if Gandalf had forgotten about it, Curdan may well have remembered Alorin as the single wisest of all the Maiar. And here he was again. Who better to give the ring that might rekindle hearts in a world that grows chill? But perhaps the most significant implication here is not just that, as is so often the case with Tolkien, humility and wisdom are greater than power and might, but getting things wrong and putting them right the next time, like the Valar did here, is understandable and worthy. Because this time, it works. The Valar's emissaries, well, Gandalf, succeed in winning the trust of the elves and the other free peoples of Middle-earth with ears to hear. Evil is defeated, and the elves, invited, not pressured, finally leave Middle-earth. The errors of old were amended and made whole. If you'd like to see more videos like this, diving deep into Tolkien's Legendarium, there's a playlist appearing now on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel, thank you. There's a link to my Patreon page on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.